getting bonded can feel like solving a puzzle. Every contractor situation is different. And the path to approval isn't always straightforward. In this episode, we're back with more real life case studies to break it all down and show you how to navigate the process. Welcome to the Contractor Success Forum. I'm Wade Carpenter with Carpenter Company CPAs. And as always, I'm joined by Stephen Brown with McDaniel Whitley Bonding and Insurance. Stephen, the last time we tackled this topic, we uncovered some great insights, but there's so much more to explore. And I'm sort of excited to hear your take on some of these additional case studies and dig into the lessons that contractors can take away from it. So are you ready to dive in on that? I'm ready, Wade. Any thoughts from last time? I enjoyed the format last time. I'm glad you did. And I appreciate you coming up with it because sometimes talking about yourself and what you do for a living is is almost boring if you talk about it so much, but this is an educational podcast and we want folks to understand that in bonding, like everything else, number one, it's about relationships. And number two, in order for things to go smoothly, you got to communicate change way ahead of time. It's just the right way to do business. You need to treat your bonding underwriter truly as partners on your board of directors. And if you care about getting them the information they need and communicating with them, you're going to have a very strong ally. If you don't like the current situation or you haven't even met your underwriters yet, talk to your bonding agent about it because the relationships are everything. I mentioned before, Wade, that as a bonding agent, we're kind of a matchmaker. They're different companies with different appetites, with different personalities. Either way, we want there to be a mix. We want there to be a match in an ideal world, a marriage made in heaven, something that goes smoothly and is an enjoyable relationship. Personally, I enjoyed that last time. I think it was interesting to see these real life case studies that you and I face every day. And I know in this format, we were just hitting you with a case study and you're giving me your honest opinion off the top of your head. And I love that because they are things that we talk about, but we don't think to tell people what we're running into. If it's okay, before we do that, I'd like to make a little announcement here. I think I mentioned a few months ago that I was working on my book. The first draft was written back in July and it's now December. We're going through editing and it's been a long process. The target date is still May of 2025. But as I mentioned ahead of time, I'm looking for beta testers for the concepts in my book for Profit First for Commercial Construction. So the reason I'm bringing this up was that I even ran some of my accountants through the instant assessment that was in the original book and people struggle with that. And my accountants couldn't do it. As I was researching the book, I had an engineer that is very intelligent and he told me he got stuck on that part of it. And too often I see contractors, they love the concept of Profit First, but they don't get started. So again, I've reconfigured the whole thing and approaching it very differently from the traditional books. And it's written in a very different format as a business fable. But anyway, long story short, here's the deal. If you're interested, this is completely free. And I am looking to do beta tests with the concept. You're going to get early access to the book and walking through the exercises specifically for contractors in a group setting. We won't be sharing your personal numbers with anybody, but your payment to me is your commitment. Your commitment to number one, doing the work and giving me honest feedback. And number two, if you like what you're seeing, I'd love an Amazon review or endorsement on it. I'm looking for up to 20 people, a cross section of contractors. I want general contractors, subcontractors, different revenue levels, different number of team members. If you're serious about trying to change your cash flow game, which is what all this is about and change your profitability. I would love to work with you on that. I can't guarantee we'll pick anybody, but we are trying to get a cross section so that we have good feedback for the book. If you're interested, we will have a link in the show notes, but it's profitfirstconstruction.com forward slash beta. Spots are limited, so don't wait because we are doing this in December. So the sooner we can get some feedback and go ahead and get moving, the better. So thank you for letting me take this off the topic for a minute. Wade, that's fantastic what you're offering to do. And I can just say this, having worked with you all these years, that if I owned a construction company, I'd jump on this offer immediately. Because first of all, it's a chance to get to experience the profit first methodology and to get your help with it at no charge. You're literally walking them through that. If you say, I don't even know if I have bought into this profit first mentality, give it a little bit of study, talk to Wade about it. But I can just tell you this, it's been the foundation of our podcast for the last, how long are we doing this Wade? Three years? We're we're getting closer to four. Wow. Okay. So four years worth of podcast and every success that a contractor has and every element of measuring that success ties into this mentality of how you treat your profit. It's fantastic. It's a great way to focus. And if you're thinking about starting something like this, you've got to start somewhere. That's my pitch. If I had a construction company, I'd be the first one to contact you. I can tell you that. Well, thank you. Again, your payment is the commitment to do the work. 
want to make sure that the way I'm teaching it is the best way that I can possibly do. With that said, let's go ahead and jump on in. First case study I'd love to throw at you, Stephen. Let's assume we've got a contractor with very seasonal revenue. Maybe they can't work because in the winter it's cold or something like that. Maybe a landscaper, all those that work outside. So it's very highly seasonal. So they got inconsistent cash flows. A lot of times they run into problems in the winter months and maybe they're looking for a bond from you. What would you tell them? How would you approach getting a bond when you know somebody has serious seasonal issues? That's a great question. As a general rule, all the seasonal contractors are spending the off season making sure their equipment's ready for the on season. And one of the main stresses, Wade, is keeping your labor force during the off period. You keep your key people involved, but you may have to lay off some of your laborers when there's not labor to be done. That cash flow is going to be higher going into your off months. And then you've got to budget in there what this cost of the off season is going to be to get your equipment up and running. Definitely make sure that your year-end financial statement correlates with the time that you're experiencing the most cash and profit and you're showing it in your year-end review financial statement. If you need a lot of bonding, that would be my advice. What advice would you have as an accountant for these seasonal contractors? Put money away for it. And that is another section of my book that's not in the other ones. But Yeah, getting equipment ready for the on season is an obsession. But I would also mention that there's other things that you can do during the off season to make money. So is this a time that you have some money built up in your company and you might want to expand or change your scope a little bit or take on some other things that may not be so affected by the season? since maybe you don't want to. Maybe you're just happy getting everything ready for the on season and then taking a little time off. I get that too. But if the off season is stressful to you, it's going to be stressful to your bottom line and you don't want to run a company that way. So I would just encourage you. It's a great time during the off season to meet with your accountant and meet with your bond underwriters and your bond agent and just go through the numbers and start talking about things and getting some ideas. Because it's the off season that you usually have the energy and the impetus to get new initiatives started. That's probably a good time to reflect on those kind of things. Yeah. If you do have a year-end statement that's right in the middle or toward the end of your off-season and you've run off a lot of expenses, then your financial statement's not going to look as good for bonding. So talk to your agent and accountant about that. How you can minimize that. So I know you mentioned getting your equipment ready during off-season, that kind of stuff. But let's just say we got another contractor that has a lot of equipment, grading guy or something like that, has hundreds of thousands of dollars tied up in excavators. So they have a bunch of money in debt and they've run up a bunch of debt. Debt starts getting a little out of control. Monthly debt payments are limiting what's cash is available. And I know after 2008, we saw a lot of those guys that couldn't make it. But how do high debt levels affect your bonding capacity? You know? How do the underwriters see that? They're going to look at your overall net worth of your company, Wade. Remember that the working capital, current assets minus current liabilities, is the key indicator of providing bonds in the short run. At some point where your amount of debt drags down your net worth, that's going to be an issue with the bonding company. I typically throw out some different rules of thumb, but do you have any rules of thumb about debt and equity? Your equity in your company needs to be at least a third higher than your working capital. Your working capital, Wade, needs to be 10% of your bonding capacity. So if you're bidding a million dollars worth of bonding, your goal is to have $100,000 of working capital and so forth. So that's the general rule of thumb. In order to get more bonding credit than to a 10% case, you need to have good financial records showing your backlog gross profit that you have built into the jobs that you're currently working. What's been billed? When's it coming in? What have you paid? What are your costs? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Good advice. Let's take another one. Let's say a contractor, you've been working with them for a few years. They seem to have pretty inconsistent profit margins. One year they're up, sometimes they're down. Sometimes they have a variety of different project sizes and different types of project. Does that make a bonding company nervous about things like that? Not generally. It just depends on how well you've been able to track and record those projects from an accounting standpoint. Are you able to get all the small projects knocked out? A lot of times I'll see a general contractor and any projects under $100,000 or $50,000 will be lumped into a general category. So they're not itemized on the work in progress report. That's just too much effort. And as a general rule, you can see that the lump together small contracts are always less profit than the regular jobs that are being managed carefully one at a time. And you might say, well, I throw a lot of expense into those small projects. 
but I would think long and hard about whether you're doing a lot of small projects as favors to people or just to keep your folks busy working at, at your cost basis. Well, I think that's a good answer. Sometimes people are taking jobs too low and whether it's a bidding problem or whether they actually know the numbers. And this really wasn't one of my case studies, but since you went down this road, let's modify this a little bit. Instead of inconsistent profit margins, let's say we got a job schedule at the end of the year and we say we're going to make 30% gross profit and it ends up with 5% gross profit. If they're inconsistent about their bidding, how does that affect your bonding? There's always certain jobs that are going to be an exception to the rule. Bond underwriters can get over that way. And there's always an explanation. We had to put X amount of cost in that we weren't anticipating, but it was actually good because it helped us do this and that. The number one thing is buying equipment versus renting equipment. You'll see some huge equipment purchases pop up. And again, I say, don't trade off the purchase and ownership of equipment for your working capital, the amount of cash you have on hand. This is hugely important. I have a gut feeling of how much I can use this equipment and how I can make it pay for itself. And that in itself will build my net worth. And that's not always the answer, is it, Wade? No, but to spin this a little bit, I agree that sometimes you have a profit fade and things happen. Construction is very unpredictable. If you've been working with somebody four or five years and they've got a history of showing on their financial statements, it's going to come in at 30%. But over three or four years, they continually see this pattern. Does that affect your thinking? It does, Wade, because again, and I guess this kind of ties back into profit first, but you have to set at all times what you want your profit to be. Just not hope. At the bare minimum, what is your profit? need to be in order to support you and your family and the other owners of the company. What does that profit need to be? And then what are your goals above that profit? So you know that old expression, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. This mentality, when you're making a ton of money and you're hoarding it, I get it. You may have had jobs where you've lost your shirt. And basically, as a contractor, you pretty much have to kill what you eat every day. And that's the mentality of a salesperson as well. You have to constantly be out there pushing, but I would say push in the right direction because if you, as a general rule, can communicate to the bonding company that I'm a general contractor and our bottom line is 5% gross profit and you consistently perform higher than that 5% gross profit, you can still take a huge dip and break even or lose money on a job. But as long as you have a track record, of hitting a normal gross profit margin, everybody's happy. If you're bringing in 30% gross profit margin, everybody's thrilled, you and the bonding company. I, I guess I sometimes see it where people continually fool themselves. And I do think at times it can be an indicator of whether they really know their costs or they're bidding it or they purposely trying to mislead. Yeah, there's so, so many situations where the contractor mentality is who cares about bonding? And all I know is I don't want to pay taxes and I want to live as profitably as I can for myself through my company. What would be your argument against and for that mentality? We see all the time that people are doing things around their taxes, that too often they pay too much attention on that. And if they've got a CPA that does any planning at all, we were just talking about this, it's on the tax planning side and not on the bonding side. Sometimes you do need to have a balanced approach to that. Taxes, bonding, as well as the third piece of that is let's not screw up your cash flow. So that's what I would say to that. That's where I was hoping you were going, Wade, because if you got your cash, you're hurting your company. And if you're hurting your company, you're hurting your ability to get bonding. So don't think about what the bonding company demands versus what taxes demand. Think about what your company demands to be healthy and just plan on paying your taxes. Just do it. You've heard that old expression, and we've talked about this before, contractors going broke being obsessed about getting out of paying taxes. If you're doing that right now, I just urge you to rethink your mentality about it because one thing in life is sure death and taxes. Another thing is the tools and equipment that you need to do your job for construction. How logically you play that game takes a lot of stress off of things because when you're obsessed with not paying taxes and you're playing the not make a profit game to an obsessive level, then you are working out of a mindset of not being consistent. That's the scariest thing in the world to bankers, bond companies. It should be to you too. It certainly is frustrating to your accountant. When your accountant gives you advice and they're a good accountant, take it, okay? And you get what you're paying for in that advice. I'd say it's the same with the bonding company and banker. Everybody's on your team. Nobody's fighting it. This is your company. You can do whatever you want. It's not a popular thing for an accountant to say, let's keep some profit in there so we can pay some taxes. But too many people like, I'll go to another accountant that knows what the gray is. It's one thing to know the law and do it properly. And it's another one that there's a lot of people that out there that 
let me just cheat. And they don't think about what it does to the bonding relationship here. To me, what's so much more important is the gray area and cheating is why you want to keep cash in your company, the power of it. And we've had so many episodes on cash flow. You have a perfect opportunity. All right, you've been playing the tax game as hard as you can. You've been showing as little or no profit as you can. You've been showing losses basically just for tax purposes. And then you say to the bond underwriter and you hear this, oh no, I made money. Yeah, okay. So the reason you want to do it the right way, which is to keep some cash in your company, is for the unforeseen things. The ability to say, hey, this is a great job. This is so much bigger than we've done before. And we want to tackle it. And here's why. Well, you make that sales pitch to the bonding company, then they're more inclined to say yes if you have a reputation of running your company the right way. If there's a huge distribution at the year end and it goes for paying taxes, a big chunk of that, that's just to pay owner's taxes. That's so understandable. If you take all the money out of it and you put it into your lake house or something and you hide that as a job cost, that's a whole nother issue. And it may be a fun game to play, but it's going to bite you eventually. Okay. Let's hit another one if we can. You, you talk about doing all this for your family in just a minute ago, trying to bring home some profit and take care of your family. So let's say we got a family owned business. And I think me and you have actually had some real life cases of this that we've talked about it, but say we've got an aging owner and maybe somebody's coming up in the business or they don't have somebody that's really trained to take it over. Maybe you do have a son or whatever, but they don't have the formal succession plan in place. Maybe the son or daughter, whoever it is, just isn't really interested in the business. What kind of bonding issues do we have when we have issues like the succession plan with generations? Who's steering the ship is the most important question that any bond underwriter would have. Now, in a situation where you have family members that are young and inexperienced coming in to take over the company, you as the captain of the ship are going to have to stay around a little bit longer. Another thing to stress during this transition period are the key employees. Make sure that your bond underwriters know who they are and that they're happy. They're going to stick around. Again, it's another reason why some of these key employees might need some ownership in your company. Or you pay them enough that their loyalty is there and someone can't hire them away. I know. Let's hit one more of these. We're getting a little longer, but I've still got another 10 or so to go after this. So we may end up having to do another third or fourth episode because I've enjoyed this format. We were talking about taxes just a little while ago and nobody wants to pay taxes, but I have a lot of contractors come to me. They're struggling to keep up with their tax payments. Maybe they didn't really plan for their taxes and they're behind a few years on their taxes and they haven't been able to get, say, a bank loan because the government taking those taxes can come before the creditors. How does overdue taxes affect... I know it affects business credit, but how can it affect your bonding capacity? I would say do everything in your power not to have a lien, a tax lien filed against your company. It's going to show up on your UCC report and the bonding company is going to know about it. So the most important thing is to come clean and make sure you have a good game plan, a game plan that works for the IRS and, and a game plan that your accountant can hold you to. Also, to make doubly sure that you are concentrated on working on the most profitable jobs. Sometimes you're just looking for a bag to breathe in. You've gotten yourself into this situation and you don't know what to do. But I can tell you with a good system in place and a good reputation for doing quality work, there's always a way to work something out over an extended period of time something that you can do because the IRS is going to get paid and how you work that involves getting the best people you can to help you come up with a game plan that will work for them and to make sure that they buy into that. So if you're in that situation now, that's the first order of business. And the second order of business is to think long and hard about the jobs that make you the most money that you routinely can perform with your forces and get done and make a profit on. That kind of information is again, what you take to your bank and your bonding company to show that your backlog gross profit is what's going to get me out of this situation. Folks understand that way. Maybe contractors don't, but I can tell you construction financiers, that's people that deal with lending money or credit to a construction company, they understand that. And at the time you go to negotiate with your key financiers, it's a good time to have a good CPA to go with you to do that, to communicate the plan with you. What if you got a contractor that hasn't been filing taxes for years or they possibly got these liens or levies coming up? Does it make a difference whether they've already got a tax payment plan in place? It most definitely does. They're still going to look at a snapshot picture of your working capital and net worth. Okay. So that tax debt, even if there's a lien filed, it's going to be showing up as a current liability and a long-term liability. So if you have a plan in place, Wade, just think about it. You may have a five-year plan to get caught up. What's a normal plan? How many years would you say? Two years, five years? Yeah, five years is about the maximum they'll give you. But say you can negotiate a five-year plan because 
you are really pulling things around on your current stuff. It's the back stuff you have to pay. Okay, so however much you owe in back taxes over a 12-month period will hurt your working capital. As far as you can extend that payment plan, it will not affect your working capital. It'll affect your net worth a little bit, okay? But that's okay. That's not going to stress a bonding company. I agree. I, I see it all the time too. It's if you got a plan in place and you know we got a set installment agreement that's X amount per month, I think that's a little easier for a bank or a bonding company to swallow than, hey, we've got all these things out there and maybe we already do have some liens filed. If an underwriter or a bank officer smells chaos, they're just going to bail. So you want to go in with a plan and you want to be as professional as you can about and, and forthright and honest as you can about communicating it. And that's your best chance of getting the help that you need. Okay. Okay. I think that's good advice. I got another 10 cases to go. So I think we're running a little long on this one. Any final thoughts from you on this? Uh, no, I've enjoyed it, Wade. I may not have answered the questions exactly in the direction that you might have been thinking, but I was trying to tell you from a bonding underwriting standpoint of what the key issues are to most underwriters. And does that mean they're right or they're wrong? Who knows? Bonding underwriters do not know how to build anything. So again, I, I have to end this podcast by reminding our listeners Get your underwriter and your agent out to look at some of your jobs that you're proud of to show off what you did differently. We're thinking we're going to make X percent profit on this and not being overly optimistic, but just reasonable. And you bring it in a little bit more than that. And then you wouldn't believe uh, the traction that builds in a relationship. To your point too, I don't know that I had any particularly preconceived notions on these case studies because what, three and a half years of doing these podcasts together, you, you have a different perspective than I do. I see it from the tax side and the financial statement side and sometimes dealing with the banks, but you know what these bond underwriters need. There's situations that you think about that I don't think about in the same way. So I, this has been valuable to me. Great. Let's do it again then. We got more of them to do. So yeah, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you for doing that, Stephen. And thank you all for listening to the Contract Success Forum. If you got questions, we're always happy to answer any of them or hear your thoughts on topics you'd like us to cover. If you want to drop them in the comments below, we'd appreciate it. Thanks again for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, please share and subscribe. Follow us every week as we post a new episode and we will see you next time.